Chapter 18 It was light when Callard awoke, blinking heavily. His head was pounding, and he winced. He heard concerned voices, and he rolled to the side, vomiting up the contents of his stomach. That only seemed to make the pain even worse, like stabbing needles behind his eyes, and he was sick again, entire body convulsing with the violence of the heaving. When, at last, the nausea left him, he lay back, exhausted, his body aching all over. He saw the canvas above him, and felt a hand on his shoulder. His memories of the beast came back to him in a rush, and he struggled to rise, crying out, but hands pushed him back onto the pallet. Spots of light filled his vision, and a wave of dizziness overcame him. Over, it's over, said a voice that he realized was Bertelis's. Black tentacles, in my mind, probing, prying, gringolet. Callard groaned. He jerked with the remembered agony. Delirious, said a different voice, one that he didn't recognize. Then everything began to fade once again, and he slipped into a tortured dream. He saw demonic faces leering at him, blood, and the dark forest canopy overhead. He saw the back of a knight riding away from him, leaving him, and he felt a stab of fear as things began to creep out of the darkness around him. He cried out in his sleep, writhing beneath sweat-soaked sheets. Will he be all right? slurred Bertalus looking down at his brother in concern. The aging physician sighed wearily. I don't know. His physical injuries are not severe and are healing well. The damage seems to be done to his mind. He shrugged. Such things are unpredictable. I am sorry. I don't know what afflicts your brother. Maybe with rest he will come back. Now, I'm sorry, but I have other men to tend to. Bertalus nodded numbly, and the physician shuffled away. The cries of the wounded and the dying were all around them. Hundreds of men lay on pallets and blankets beneath the awning, and more were being brought in every minute. The man had probably not slept at all since the battle began. He heard men moaning in pain, and winced at the screams as grisly amputations were performed. He took another long draught from the wineskin in his hand. The death toll had been high. Barely a hundred knights survived the night of blood. Of those, maybe twenty would die of their wounds before the day was done, and another dozen would bear crippling injuries for the rest of their lives. Bertelis's own head was wrapped in bandages, and his right arm was strapped and held immobile in a splint. He was told that he wouldn't be able to wield a sword or a lance for months. He had been desperately fighting to reach his brother, and had fallen heavily as the steed had been cut out from under him. As he had struggled to rise, an axe had smashed into his helmet, wrenching it out of shape and cutting deep into his scalp. He was lucky that it had been just a glancing blow, or else his skull would have surely been smashed. As it was, he had been told that he had received a fracture, and he found that exerting himself in any way, even just walking for more than ten steps, made him feel nauseous and dizzy. He had managed to pull his helmet off his head, and his face was awash with blood. He had been unable to focus his eyes, let alone stand and fight. He dimly remembered the beasts looming above him, and he thought that in that moment more had come to get him. And then someone had killed the creatures, and stood sentinel above him. It was Guntar. With a hazy, unfocused eye, he had seen the aging weapon master kill maybe a dozen of the monsters. With astonishing speed and displaying all his skill, Guntar had fought furiously to defend him. At last, the knight had fallen, pierced by blades and spears, his armor covered in blood and punctured in a dozen places. Bertalis had cried out as the noble weapon master had finally fallen, an axe slamming into the neck with brutal force. Gundar had fallen facing Bertalus, and he had watched the light slip out of his eyes. He had died so that Bertalus could live, for moments later the enemy swarming around him was pushed away. The young knight swore and took another swig of wine. The death of the old man haunted him. The end of the battle was still a confused blur. There had been a terrible sound, 
an exultant cry of bestial triumph that echoed across the battlefield. It had pierced his mind, and then the battle ended. On hearing the cry, the beasts of the forest slunk back into the trees, abandoning the field. Those embroiled in combat fought on, and it had taken over an hour before battle finally stopped but the fight had been over as soon as that exultant bestial cry had sounded. Thousands of peasants had been killed, and the stink of the mass graves was revolting. Even in death, the peasants managed to sicken him, he thought resentfully. He looked down at Kellard's great-inch face. For the past twelve hours, he had maintained a vigil over his brother, watching as he tossed fitfully, moaning and crying out in his sleep. Still, he was still alive which was more than could be said about most of the knights that fought that night. Garamond peasants had found Callard, lying comatose amid piles of the dead, and at first they mourned for him. They had borne his lifeless body back to camp, convinced that he had been claimed by more. It was only when one of the duke's physicians examined him that a faint fluttering heartbeat was felt. There had been no victory celebration, for in reality there had been no victory. They hadn't slain the beast leading the enemy, nor had they sent the creatures fleeing from the battlefield. They had simply left on their own. What was it all for? It seemed to him that there was no point in the attack, and no point to calling it off when they did. But then, the creatures were little more than animals. Beasts driven by the senseless urge to kill, like a fox in the hen house. It was folly to try to understand their motive. Grief and black despair gripped him, and he shouted for more wine as he drained the wineskin. He kept thinking back to Tanneborg's face, frantic with fear as he begged for death. He had believed for a time that his mother was sleeping with the man, although he spoke his thoughts to no one, not even Callard. And then, one night, his blood fired with drink, he had confronted her with the allegation. She slapped him, hard across the cheek her pale face flushed with anger. The blow stung. How dare you, she had snarled, lines creasing her thick makeup. He believed her when she refuted the accusation, but even if he had never consummated that lust, Tanneborg did desire her, and Bertelis knew that she was a manipulator. He was certain that she was able to twist Tanneborg to perform any deed she asked of him. Would she really try to have her husband's first son killed, though? It was with horrible reluctance that he had to admit she might. The evidence showed that she must have been the one behind the attempt, but that knowledge was his and his alone. A fresh wineskin was brought to Bertelus, and he snatched it from the hands of a peasant. Breaking the seal, he gulped down the wine greedily, seeking oblivion. Callard lay down upon the pallet for four days, tossing and turning, tormented by nightmares and demons. He woke several times, and the peasants set to watch over him managed to force some water and food into him, but he was often delirious and confused in those moments of wakefulness. In a drunken stupor, Bertelis verbally abused the peasants and lashed out at them, ranting and stumbling, before he collapsed unconscious in a pool of his own vomit, and was carried off to his tent. When Callard finally rose from the fever, he was ravenously hungry and thirsty, and would gorge himself. He felt sore all over, as if he had been trampled beneath a herd of cattle, and his head was still paining him, although, blessedly, even that discomfort lessened as he ate and drank. His brother came to see him, looking haggard and reeking of alcohol. He had been greatly cheered to see Bertelus, although he was disturbed by his brother's state. The young, blond-haired knight was unshaven and seemed to be fighting his own demons although he was clearly relieved and pleased to see Callard lucid and on the way to getting better. Callard grieved when he learned about Guntar's fate, a deep sadness overwhelming him. He wept tears for the night, although he hurriedly blinked them away, and it was with pride and respect that he heard of the Weapon Master's final moment. He died doing his duty, but Callard wished that he had spent more time with him. He had so much yet to learn, and he cursed himself for not being more attentive and respectful to the old knight. It was too late now, and Callard regretted it dearly. He couldn't have imagined a time without Guntar's stern presence. 
and now that he was gone, there was a vacuum in his life that he felt would never get filled. He similarly mourned for Gringolet. It would be impossible to replace the noble Destrier. With shock and horror, he learned of the extent of the losses, too. So many men died, the majority of whom he had gotten to know quite well over the course of the campaign. Baron Moncadas had survived, although he lost his left eye when a beast's jaws had closed around his head. He regaled Callard with the account of how he killed the monster, dislocating its jaws and beating it to death with his fists. In truth, Callard had been uncertain whether the Baron was exaggerating or not, but he suspected not. It seemed nothing could kill this barrel-chested bear of a man. The Baron had pursued the beast into the forest, but he had called off the hunt, fearing ambush. The beast had melted quickly into the trees and were gone, leaving only devastation behind them. With the departure of the creatures, the unnatural forest that encircled Adeline's seat had begun to decay at a heightened rate. The trees rotted away within days, collapsing under their own weight and filling the air with their putrid stench. Insects and worms arrived through the liquefying mass that blanketed the land, and birds swarmed in their thousands to pick through the rotting morass. Within a month, the existence of the vile forest would be little more than a memory, although the fields would be tainted for generations. Driven by restlessness, Kellard ignored the protest of the Baron's little physician and was soon up on his feet. He moved around stiffly, flexing his tight limbs and stretching bed sore muscles. His wounds were healing well, and though it would be many weeks before the shoulder was healed where the arrow had struck him, he had retained some movement there. It was as he moved through with some training exercises with the sword that Anara had come to him, along with the Grail Knight Riolas. He had never been so close to the revered knight, and he was awed and humbled in his presence. Anara was coolly distant, not even asking how he fared, much to his disappointment. But the Grail Knight did ask about his health with genuine concern. Seen up close, it was impossible to gauge the Grail Knight's age. His face was smooth and unlined, untouched by any scar, which would have been remarkable even if he had fought in only half the battles it was claimed he had. Indeed, if the stories were to be believed, he had once borne a horrible scar across his face, from his ear to his lips, but the scar had disappeared when he had drunk from the Lady's Grail. He was not a handsome man, which had surprised Callard, his features evoking power and strength more than manly beauty. His jaw was square and thick, his brows heavy, the nose broad and flat. It was the face of a warrior, of that there was no doubt, and he wore his hair clipped short, flecks of silver at his temples. In reality, he didn't look like the romanticized hero sung about in his ballads. There were no flowing golden locks or beauty to make married women and virgins swoon, but he certainly had an awesome presence indeed, one that demanded respect. There was something about him that Callard could not put his finger on, something that made him seem just a bit bigger, a little fiercer, a little more imposing than any other man, something a little more vital. There was an off-putting, intense burning light in his eyes, a fey potency, otherworldly and dangerous. Kellar found that he couldn't hold the Grail Knight's gaze for long. I fought alongside your father, the Grail Knight said, making Kellar widen his eyes in surprise. A good man, strong. At Drowning Man's Moor, he led a desperate countercharge against the restless dead that turned the battle. That battle was more than four decades ago, said Kellar softly his eyes getting larger. The Grail Knight simply smiled back at him. Kellard wanted to ask a million questions, but he didn't wish to appear like a gawking adolescent. You fought the beast, said Riolas, the smile dropping from his face. I... I wanted the glory of killing it, said Kellard. I thought I could best it, but I failed, he said, hanging his head. It was a brave attempt. Gundar would say that it was foolish. Impetuous, I would say. Why did it leave? said Callard. The question had been troubling him. Why did it not finish what it started? Surely it could have won the battle. 
It could, said Riolus, eyes burning with witch fire. Had the battle lasted another hour, there would have been no Bretonian left alive, knight or otherwise. In truth, I don't know, Callard. We were hoping that you could shed some light onto it. Me? asked Callard in shock. It took something from you, said Anara vaguely, staring around. Her eyes seemed to be following invisible movements in the air. It was unnerving, like the way a cat would stir and stare intently at a blank wall, as if seeing something beyond the ken of human perception. Callard shivered. What did she see? In truth, he didn't want to know. Her eyes came back into focus and she stared at Callard. It touched your mind. What did it see? Callard blanched as he felt a flash of remembered pain in his head of the insidious tentacles pushing into his mind, sifting through the memories like an open book, rummaging through his deepest desires, his hopes, his aspirations. It felt as if he had been violated by the hateful creature, and he shuddered, feeling again the tainted touch of the creature inside him. It saw everything, said Callard, voice thick, eyes haunted. Every memory, everything I've ever experienced. He didn't say how for a brief moment he felt linked to the creature, seeing its memories as if they were his. In those moments, he had experienced all that the beast felt, and he had reveled in that power, the destruction, the taste of blood on his lips. He had felt savage joy as he had relived the killing, the destruction that the beast had wrought. He had felt the beast's rage at the things beautiful and peaceful, felt how they mocked him, how he had yearned to see the world burn. Were those just the beast's memories overlaid above his, or did they reflect the dark desires that he kept hidden even from himself? Had the beast tainted him in those brief moments when their minds had melded together? Was he now damned? It found what it was seeking in you, said Anara, her eyes burning deep into his soul. Could she see the taint that he feared was lurking deep inside? What was it? What did it find? I don't know. It saw everything. Everything that I am. It saw in those moments. The air in the tent became icy, and the light seemed to dim. The pain in his head returned. It felt like seething maggots were burrowing inside his brain, and he clenched his eyes tightly shut. Images flashed in his mind, images that the beast had seen, felt and experienced, just as he had experienced its memories. He didn't want to feel that again, didn't want to see it again, and he pushed against it. What did it see? Anara asked again, her voice cold and insistent. It was she. She was doing this, making him relive those moments as he lay helpless beneath the beast. Stop it, moaned Callard fighting against her, resisting. What did it see? She asked icily. Unable to hold back the flood of images, Callard succumbed, and it was like a dam bursting. He was lost adrift in a sea of images, feelings and memories. They flicked through his mind like a parade one after the other. Again, he felt a hot surge of savage victory as the beast had found what it wanted. Father, murmured Callard, vision swimming, as he came back to himself. He was on the ground, although he didn't remember falling, and he wiped at the foam at his lips. What? What was it? Anara asked, peering down at him, her face intense and cold, almost cruelly so. He glared up at her. She had done this to him. She made him relive those painful moments. The throbbing pain in the head subsided, and he pushed himself upright, breathing heavily. It saw Castle Garamond. It saw our father. Dawning comprehension fell over Anara's face. Riolus helped Gallard back to his feet, his face cold and stern, lit with the same impassioned light that had infected his sister. What does it mean? He finally asked, looking at Anara. He had never felt so distant from her than in that moment, even in all the years they had spent apart. She seemed like someone he didn't know at all, and she looked at him as if he were a stranger. I know what it is, she finally said, and I know where it has gone. 
Claude pulled his eye away from the tear he cut in the fabric, and backed away from the tent. He limped heavily through the camp, wincing at the wounds he suffered. In truth, he had been amazed that he survived. Only a few pilgrims had, and he was one of those lucky few. He had shaved the top of his head, and had strapped a battered breastplate awkwardly to his chest. A sword, its blade broken halfway along the length, hung from his belt, alongside various other artifacts of holy importance that he had stripped away from the dead bodies of other pilgrims. He looked every inch the weary battle pilgrim, and he was confident that the disguise would keep him away from a hanging. He limped back to the fire of the pilgrims, and they clustered around him. A sausage was pushed into his hands, and he ate it greedily, fat dripping down his chin, as the pilgrims waited on his word with bated breath. It had been easy to dominate the remaining pilgrims, and he had appointed himself their abbot. As such, he had a pick of the food, and the least louse-infected blanket to sleep beneath. He could get used to this life, he thought. Do you know where we go? asked one of the devout peasants, who sported a livid open wound upon his face. Already it was infected, the flies clustering around the cut. Our gloried benefactor is preparing for a journey, announced Claude between mouthfuls of sausage. And so we must journey with him. Anara was speaking in an alien tongue, her voice soft and lilting. The sound was musical and enchanting, and it made the hair on the back of his neck stand erect. He had never heard such beautiful sounds, although something in them was vaguely unsettling, even frightening. Unbidden, the memory of a childhood rhyme set to ward off the face spirits of the woods leapt into his mind. His steed whinnied, and he stroked its nose to comfort it. It was a good horse, a big chestnut with a brave heart, but it was not Gringolet. At Anara's insistence, the eyes of each of the horses had been covered with cloth. Only twenty-five knights had been chosen, although Callard didn't understand the nature of the journey. Surely they had no time for the ritual, whatever this was. The beast was the better part of a week ahead of them, and he had no idea how they were to find it, or catch up to it. It was all so confusing. He didn't understand what was occurring around him, and it made his anger rise to be kept in the dark so. He had been surprised and honored when he was picked to accompany Riolas and the others, although he didn't know why he had been chosen. It is only right. All will be made clear, Anara had said mysteriously. He found these vague statements infuriating, but he didn't argue. He had, however, expressed his displeasure when Malaric had been singled out as well to accompany them, but his words had been for naught. Riolas had chosen the young Sangas noble, seeing in him someone destined for greatness, he claimed, although Callard found that hard to believe. Malaric had tricked him somehow, he was certain of that, although how he did that was beyond him. He wished that his brother could have joined them, but his injuries were such that it was impossible. He felt a deep unease at the prospect of riding to battle without Guntar, Berdelis, or Gringolet. His brother would remain with the rest of the knights and Baron Moncadas. He prayed that he would see them again. His sister lifted a silk kerchief before her, and delicately unwrapped it to reveal an oak leaf gleaming in gold. She continued to speak in the beautiful fey language, and the leaf began to shine with a golden inner light. Mist began to rise from the still pond they were arrayed before, as if summoned by Anara's lilting voice. It flowed across the top of the mirror-like pool and coiled around his legs. It billowed upwards, and with a gasp, Callard saw a ghostly shape take form within the mist. It glided forwards like a spirit, its body translucent, and he saw that it was a woman of incredible haunting beauty. The lady, Callard breathed in awe. Her hair flowed around her as if she were underwater, and her billowing dress rippled like the surface of a lake. Her arms were held out to either side, and she glided through the mist like an apparition. She seemed to glow from within, and yet Callard could see the trees on the far side of the pool through her body. Her lips moved, but Callard heard no sound. Anara answered her, still speaking in that otherworldly tongue, 
and the ethereal, graceful lady gestured with one elegant, slender limb. She inclined her head to Riola's, who bowed deeply, and then her almond-shaped eyes roved over the gathered knights. Kellard felt his mouth dry up as he felt the power of those eyes turn towards him. He lowered his gaze, toying with the reins in his hands, unable to meet her stare. After what felt like an age, he felt her attention shift away from him, and he sagged, feeling drained. Billowing mist surrounded the legs of the warhorse, as if stirred by a growing wind, although no breeze penetrated the sacred copse. He lifted his eyes once again, gazing around in wonder. Glowing orbs of light circled in the mist, like will-o'-the-wisps from children's tales, and he realized that the trees around him were fading. He thought he heard high-pitched giggles from the glowing spheres of light as they swooped around his head, and he tried to focus on them to see past their blinding light. He felt his cloak and hair being tugged at by tiny, mischievous hands, and he almost laughed out loud in wonder. The mist began to swirl around the clearing with more vigor, centered on the heavenly vision of womanhood and Kellard's mouth hung slack in wonder. He heard haunting music, and a thousand achingly beautiful voices lifted in whispered song all around. Tears ran down his cheeks. In wonder, he glanced at Riolas. He realized, strangely, with no sense of alarm, that he could see through the grail knight, as if his body were as ethereal as the mist billowing around him. Anara, too, seemed as insubstantial as smoke, and with a shock, Callard lifted his hands before his face to see that they too were transparent and ghostly, like smoke to be carried away on the wind. His heart beat fiercely in his chest, and he found it suddenly hard to breathe. The chestnut destrier too was as insubstantial as a ghost, as were the reins in his hand. He turned his head to one side, and saw that the other knights too were gazing in fear and wonder at their limbs, and he saw the dread in Malaric's ghostly eyes. Moncadas lifted a hand in farewell. He alone among the gathered knights was not insubstantial, his body and limbs as solid as ever. Be calm, said Anara's voice, sounding like a distant whisper. No harm shall come to you. Step forward into the mist. Callard saw that the vision of the lady was fading, and he cried out to her, not wanting to be parted from her holy presence. A hint of a smile played upon her lips, and then she was gone. Callard could see nothing of his surroundings now, the mist having swallowed everything. The other knights were gone, as was Anara, and he was alone, lost adrift in the mist. Step forward, said Anara's whispering voice, apparently from a great distance. And Callard closed his eyes and did as she told him, leading his chestnut warhorse forward. Baron Moncadas stood motionless, watching until the knights and the Nara had been completely faded out of sight. The ghostly mist dissipated, and he was alone in the sacred copse. He whispered a final parting blessing and walked out into the sunshine. A ragtag group of grail pilgrims were clustered around the grail sanctuary, sitting around a small fire over which a scrawny hair was spitted. Barely a dozen of them had survived the battle and they looked up at him expectantly, their faces brightening. Seeing that he was not their lord, their shoulders slumped, and they turned back to the fire. Moncadas began to walk back into the camp, but paused, looking back at the wretched little band of pilgrims. Being of low birth, they would be hanged if they were discovered entering the sacred copse surrounding the grail shrine, and doubtless they would wait here beyond its edges until Riolas emerged. He smirked thinking that they would be waiting a long time indeed. How long before they realized that Riolas was not going to return for them? A month? A year? Until death claimed them? That was most likely, he thought. They would wait there like loyal, abandoned hounds for the return of their master, who was, even now, hundreds of miles away. He felt a sudden pang of guilt for them. They had bled to defend Bretonia from the monsters, just as everyone else here had, and he felt he owed them at least the knowledge that their master was gone. Turning around, Moncada strode towards the pitiful group. They saw him coming and jumped to their feet, lowering their eyes and wringing their hands nervously. Nobles spoke to them infrequently, and when they did, it was usually to drive them away or curse them. 
Moncadas cleared his throat. Lord Riolas is gone, he said. It is pointless for you to wait for him. He will not come back this way. The pilgrims traded glances, confused by the words. Moncadas nodded his head, his guilt assuaged, and turned to leave. My, my lord, stammered one of the pilgrims, and the baron turned back towards them, eyebrow raised in question. The one who had spoken was a hunchbacked wretch with an uneven face. The man bowed several times, and the rat poked its head out briefly from his tunic. The pilgrim bit his thick lip, but did not speak any further. What is it? Speak out, man, said Moncadas impatiently. We, we are his pilgrims, my lord, and we must follow in his footsteps wherever he leads us. And? We, we saw him go into the trees, my lord. He has not come out. The man was speaking his words carefully, trying not to sound antagonistic. Is he not, therefore, still inside? I said that he has gone, and so he has. He is gone. Moncadas turned away and began to walk away from the pilgrims, tiring of the discussion. Please, my lord, cried the hunchback pilgrim, limping after him. Where has he gone? Moncadas gave a long sigh and paused. To Baston he said over the shoulder, and then marched away. It seemed like an age had passed before the mist began to clear, and Callard began to make out shapes around him again. Shadows of trees loomed over him, and he saw the stars overhead, glinting in between the boughs and leaves. He recognized these woods, and his brow creased in confusion. Like ghosts appearing out of the mist, he saw the others walking alongside him, each one leading a horse, and Anara, walking out in front, leading her mare. A chill wind rustled the leaves overhead, and the mist lifted away, dissipating as if it had never been. Callard saw that his limbs were solid once again, and let out a breath of amazement. It was night time, and Mansley was glowing a disk of white light in the heavens above, although it had been the break of dawn but moments before. Anara removed the scarf covering her mare's eyes, and the other knights did likewise. In silence, they followed the damsel through the woods, gazing around in wondering incomprehension. And finally, they came to the edge, and again, Callard's jaw dropped. In the distance, out across the rolling, dark fields, was his home, Castle Garamond, and it was on fire. <laughs>